So I'm very excited about uh, today's uh, session. Really important. I am packing about four hours worth of training into one hour. So some of the, these things may feel a little bit compressed or maybe a lot of information. I will have a slide at the end, which is in your package, with some resources and some additional uh, videos you can watch that will complement uh, this training. So um, we only have an hour, so I want to cover a lot of ground in one hour. I strongly recommend that you do have the, the slides and by your side. We're not going to go over the slides in detail. We're going to do most of it in product, but the slides would actually help me and help you to know exactly where we stand. Okay, let me get started with a quick polling question. So this will be the first polling question, and we'll run a total of five polling questions. So we'll go over with an extra polling question just in case uh, so we can get our CPEs done. I think we only need three out of the five to get them, so we're going to be asking them throughout. I'd like to understand what your current uh, level of uh, relationship with inventory at the moment. You know, do you have no experience with it? Do you have basic, intermediate, advanced? That will give me a, an idea more or less uh, at what pace and what speed and what level of details I should cover. Okay, so we got the polling question up. It's up for about 30 seconds. And we're going to leave it for 30 more seconds. So we can get the answers. We have about 91% of the votes. We got 20 seconds left. Please give us an answer. There's no right or wrong answer. Any answer will do. So we got about 10 seconds left um, to end this poll. So I would appreciate those answers. Okay, so let's go ahead and close the poll. Perfect, and I'll share the results real quick so you get an idea more or less. So we have about 20% are brand new, 45% basic, 30% intermediate, and 5% advanced. So based on the results, uh, we're going to stay in the intermediate area just to kind of try to satisfy as many folks as possible. So basic to intermediate would be the pace in which I will try to pace myself anyway. All right, so managing inventory with QuickBooks Desktop. My name is Hector Garcia, and I'd like to thank Avalara for sponsoring uh, this webinar. Avalara is a leader in sales tax compliance and provides solutions uh, to help you file, remit, and service your client's sales tax needs. They have several free tools on the website, so check it out to help you calculate sales tax and some low-cost solutions for filing tax returns. We will not be talking about Avalara at all. We're just thanking them for sponsoring the entire webinar. And I strongly recommend that you, if you do any sales tax work with your clients, take a look at Crush DC, May 9th to the 11th. It's going to be Avalara's conference. Connect with peers, uh, discuss strategies, learn about um, accounting needs for not just sales tax uh, related and, uh, issues, I mean, all sorts of accounting issues because you're going to have uh, other professionals taking CPE classes and that sort of thing. So check it out. It's called Crush DC, May 9th to the 11th. Okay. So about myself real quick, uh, my name of my company is QuickBook Keeping. We do QuickBooks Consulting and QuickBook Sales. For the most part, I co-host another webinar called a QB Power Hour and a podcast called Art of Advisory. So check those out. My phone numbers in the screen and my emails on the screen. I'm typically pretty good at helping my peers with questions that are, have to do with QuickBooks or inventory. Today we're going to focus about uh, learning how QuickBooks interacts with items in transactions to post uh, sales, assets, cost of goods sold, so all the general ledger accounting related. Um, uh, effects of inventory. Uh, we'll learn about the non-posting transactions, which is the heart of the business operation. Uh, things like purchase orders and sales orders, we'll discuss that. And then at the end, we'll talk about managing inventory by making adjustments or taking a look at inventory reports. So this is the table of contents. And so again, this is about four to five hour uh, class compressed into one hour. So we're going to hit all these topics up uh, fairly quick, quickly that you see on the screen. And we're going to start with item types. First order of business. QuickBooks uh, allows you to turn on inventory and use an inventory part. If you don't turn on inventory, you'll be using a non-inventory part. So let's start with that. So this is the very basic stuff 
uh, for the group of folks that were more interested on, on that portion. So when you uh, create an item in QuickBooks, uh, and this is something that you're going to use in a transaction. So for example, when I'm creating an invoice, I should have in QuickBooks a drop-down menu with all the current items that I use. Now, some of these items may be inventory part, as you see on the screen, and some of them may be non-inventory part. The difference is inventory part will uh, affect three accounts, and a non-inventory part will affect possibly just one account. So let's let's discuss what that means. I'm going to go into the list menu and I'm going to click on item list. And then I'm going to go ahead and create a new item by clicking on the item menu in the bottom and clicking on new. When I create an item, I'm given a choice with the word inventory on it. I have inventory part, inventory assembly, which I'll cover a little bit later on, and then a non-inventory part. Let's start with non-inventory part. So non-inventory part will be for folks that want to uh, track part numbers in QuickBooks, but they don't want the purchases to go into the balance sheet or accumulate uh, an asset balance over, over time. They want that part to affect uh, a different account in the general ledger, not a balance sheet account. So when you use a non-inventory part, and let's call this uh, test NI part, so we'll call this test NI part. When we create a non-inventory part, we actually have a choice to use more than one account, but you actually have to hit the checkbox. So the first, by default, it only allows you to hit one account or to affect one account. In this case, this is the revenue account. If I actually don't select a different account, this account will be affected on both uh, sales and purchases. So I'm going to do an example of that and then show you what the effect is of hitting this little checkbox here that actually sends it uh, to two accounts. So we're not going to hit this checkbox for now. We're just going to leave the non-inventory part as is, and we're only going to affect uh, one of the accounts. So let's say we're going to give this a price of $100. So there we go, $100, and then we'll hit OK. And then let's go ahead and create an invoice in which we are going to sell to one of these customers my test non-inventory part, and let's sell them 100 units for $100 a pop, which gives me a total of $10,000. I'm also going to date this, a very specific date. I'm going to date it 12-21-21, and I'm using a, a, a random date like this just to make it really easy for my reports to identify later on. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Save. Then I'm going to hit my Profit and Loss Report. So I'm going to go to Reports, Company Financial, Profit and Loss Standard, and I'm going to go to 12-21-21, and... 12, 21, 21, and 12, 21, 21. And that's going to show me the one transaction. Now, for some strange reason, there was something else here on the postage and delivery. Let me delete this because I was not expecting that. I just want to see one transaction in there. So we're looking at the sale for $10,000. Now, what happens if I purchase that product using the same non-inventory part? So I'm going to create a bill real quick. I'm going to go to Vendors. Go to enter bills. And I'm going to go ahead and pick a vendor here at random. And I'm going to pick an item by clicking on the item tab and telling QuickBooks that I'm actually purchasing those parts that I just uh, sold. So I'm going to go here to test NI part. And let's say that I'm actually buying 150 of them. So let's put 150. And let's say we're paying $75 a pop. So my total purchase or my total um, uh, acquisition of, of parts to sell was uh, 150 units at $75 a pop, which is going to render the amount bigger than my sale amount because at this point I'm buying more than what I'm selling. And this is the essential existential issue we have with folks that don't track inventory parts. So what we just did was we netted our revenue and our immediate cash basis cost because we didn't use an inventory part. So we have two essential problems that we just created. One, we're not accounting for inventory properly, so that's a issue number one. And uh, number two, we are netting the two accounts, right? essentially just giving me the difference between the two. Now, if I were to double click on that 1250, you're actually gonna see both uh, the credits and the debits related to this transaction. You're gonna see the sell for 10,000 and the purchase for 11,000. So this is causing two problems. One netting my two accounts, one issue, and two, uh, not accounting for my inventory properly, therefore giving me 
a loss that's really not a loss. So let me go back into this item. So I'm going to go to list, item list. And I'm going to go down and edit this item. And click on edit item. And I'm going to go ahead and click the magic checkbox. And the magic checkbox is this item is used in assemblies or is purchased for a specific customer or job. Now, if you were not, if you never really read that before, if you're reading that for the first time, I don't think anyone will ever understand really what that check mark means. But in a, essentially, what that check mark means, what it only means, is that we are now going to tell QuickBooks that the behavior of these items in transactions are going to be different based on the type of transaction. So if I'm creating a bill, a check, or a credit card charge, it's going to affect my expense account. So in this case, I'm going to hit, uh, let's see if we have a purchases account. That's perfect. So I have a purchases cost to goods sold account that I want QuickBooks to, to use um, during a purchase situation. And then I have the revenue account that we already had set up before for the sales situation. So when I do this and I hit OK, QuickBooks will now ask me the magic question, which is, do you want me to go back in time and retroactively recalculate every single transaction using the new account? If I hit no, uh, nothing's going to happen. So I'm going to hit no, and then I'm going to go back into my profit and loss report, and nothing happened. Not surprised by that. So if I go back to my item list again, and I'm going to go into uh, test NI part, I'm going to uncheck this and hit OK, and then I'm going to do it again, double click on it again, and then hit the check mark now, and then hit purchases. And this time around, I'm actually going to hit OK on the retroactive part. So I'm going to hit yes. So I'm going to say yes, I want you to update retroactively. We're going to go back into our profit and loss report, and now we're going to see a clean, proper separation of our revenue and cost of goods sold. So that's uh, the, the, the deal with non-inventory parts and how you could potentially make them uh, uh, hit the correct accounts, cost of goods sold and income without tracking inventory, but at least uh, hitting the correct accounts. Now, what happens if this item becomes a non I mean, uh, an inventory part? So let's go ahead and show you that. I'm going to go ahead and close this windows here. I'm also going to pull up a balance sheet. So I'm going to go to company and financial balance sheet standard. And I'm going to click on window, tile vertically. So I show them both next to each other. And then on here, I'm going to choose 12 21 2021 because I want the dates to be the same. And then I'm going to click on customize reports and make that complete paired to the previous period dollar change and hit OK for a second because I really want to see is the changes in my inventory account. OK, so well, I'm doing that so you can see live what's happening uh, while I'm making modifications to this. So I'm going to go back into my item list and I'm going to uh, modify that same uh, test NI item. So let me go double click on it and I'm going to change the name now to test uh, inventory item. So just changing the name there. And I'm switching this from inventory part to inventory part. In other words, I am making a conversion and I'm, I'm making a strategic decision to make all of my historical transactions attached to this current non-inventory part to a new, to now an inventory part. And this is going to retroactively change my financial statements, which is what I'm trying to achieve for the purposes of the webinar but maybe not always trying to achieve that in the real world. In the real world, I would probably recommend disabling the non-inventory parts and creating new inventory parts to start fresh. But if you make the conversion, just remember that if you make this conversion, it will make a permanent change to all your financial statements, including a change to my net income. So as soon as I hit OK, what I want you to focus in on is on that net income number, uh, because that net income number is going to change because I'm converting the non-inventory part to inventory part. So I'm going to hit OK, and then I'm going to hit OK to accept it. So again, take a look at that uh, net income number, and then also take a look at the inventory account associated with it. So what basically this last account does in the bottom is this tells uh, QuickBooks that if I purchase more than what I sold, where is that balance going to go? And the answer is, it's going to go inside of this inventory asset account. So I'm going to go ahead and hit OK, and then hit OK. It's giving you a second warning saying, hey, by the way, it cannot be undone. 
So really important. So we hit OK. And then it tells you one more time, be careful. And then we're going to hit yes anyway. And then what we want to do is now we want to see that the profit and loss now correctly changes. Now I have my correct cost of goods sold based on the actual items that were sold. And then when I look at my inventory uh, asset account, I notice that my inventory asset went up by 3750 which essentially is, let me just double click on that, which essentially is uh, me purchasing an extra uh, 50 units that I haven't sold yet for $75 a pop. And that's what that balance is. So it tells you right there what the balance is. So that's what I call the basics of understanding how uh, QuickBooks non-inventory parts and inventory parts affect your accounting. So that being said, let's let's do uh, an in, a polling question and take the opportunity while the polling question is up to ask any questions or read the questions that we have here from you guys in the chat. Okay, so now I got, um, uh, we got about 30 seconds up and then we say we have about 36% uh, once in a blue moon and 31% a uh, couple times a year and 29% often and 4% uh, uses all the time and it is uh, their specialty. So for the 4 or 5% that use QuickBooks as specialty uh, and we're expecting really advanced con con content, sorry, probably will not be covered, but take a look at the videos and the resources at the end of the deck, because uh, we may cover that there. I will somehow try to do show you something new though, because I would like to at least have everybody walk out with something new. Um, let's see. So I got an awesome question here that says, can an inventory asset account be broken down by different type? So let me go ahead and close the polling question and let me answer that. So the next uh, general question that we get is, you know, what if my inventory products are grouped in a, in a logical fashion? Um, you know, whereas, you know, let's say we sell uh, clothing and we want to put shirts and shirts in one category, pants in another category, how would I group them for inventory evaluation purposes? So what you would do is you would have multiple inventory asset accounts. So let me go back into uh, my item list here and let's, I'm going to, uh, modify this test inventory part. And instead of sending it to inventory assets, I'm going to create another account called uh, non-durable goods. Okay, so in, in essence, I'm going to create two inventory accounts. One is going to be called non-durable goods, and just for the sake of the example, and we make this an other current asset. And then I'm going to hit OK and hit Yes. And then I'm going to go into my current chart of accounts and I'm going to look for my current inventory asset account. And I'm going to change the name of this one to durable goods. Again, we're just creating two categories for this. So I'm going to call this uh, durable goods. And we'll hit uh, save and close. Uh, and we're going to go into our balance sheet. And then what I want you to notice is that now we actually have our inventory classified in two. We have a non-durable goods. 3750 and then we have our durable goods the stuff that already had in there for 46,000 so that's to answer that question on how you can separate them or group them together um, or, or group them together based on any sort of logical fashion you could also go back into the chart of accounts and make both of those accounts a sub account of maybe a, a, a one inventory asset account if you want to so that's a common question that we that we get so hopefully uh, that answered that Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide here. Okay, so we cover that. So let's talk about organizing your item list. And this is by far one of my favorite ways uh, to deal with, especially with clients that have large inventory lists. You have to organize them and clean them in a way to make it really easy for your client to find a product. So we'll talk about sorting, filtering, and customizing the columns, working with custom fields, and we'll talk about the inventory center. So when you are dealing with inventory parts, what you want to do is you want to go into the list menu and item list. And I'm going to maximize that. And unfortunately, um, there are the, the, the default way that people group 
their items is by making them sub items of some master item. And that is a good idea, a great idea for reports and filtering. The problem is it becomes really, really messy. I I've hardly ever go to a client that manages their own accounting and their own QuickBooks that somehow gets the items right and the accounts right and all that stuff. So adding one more layer, such as an inventory part, that's actually a sub item of another uh, parent account. And then somehow also the user having the discipline to never use the parent account because QuickBooks recognizes the parent item as an item in itself. And it really creates a mess. So what I like to do is I like to not have sub items and there are cases in which I do. So I'll, I'll accept that. But what I like to do is I like to uh, group them uh, using uh, custom fields. So what I'll do is I'm going to double click on any of the items. It really doesn't matter which one. And then I'm going to click on custom fields. And then I'm going to create, uh, I'm going to click on define fields and I'm going to create a couple of custom fields. So there's this thing called shelf or warehouse. You can ignore that for now. I'm going to create one custom field called uh, product type. I'll call it product type. And then we'll call the other one uh, color, just to say an example. So I'll put a check mark on both of these under use. That means I want to use them. And then I hit OK. And then what I'm going to do is on each of the products, I'm going to give each of these a product type. So let me call this one uh, fixture. And then the color in this case, let's call it brass. Okay. And you, you see where I'm going as I copy, a, uh, as I add custom fields to a couple of these. So let me click on another one and then go to custom fields, do the same thing, fixture, and then brass. And then I'll hit OK. And then I'm going to pick another one. I'm just going to scroll down here. I ram them here double click and then click on custom fields and let's call this one a uh, fixture as well and then the color in this case is uh, golden okay and I'll hit okay and I'll do one more is there anything else that's uh, golden around here okay this one and then we'll do our custom fields and we'll call this one chandelier hope I'm spelling that right and then the color is golden so again what I'm doing is I'm I'm using custom fields to identify uh, products in a in a logical way. So I'm going to do is I'm going to right click anywhere on the screen and I'm going to click on customize columns. OK, that's actually kind of a hidden feature. A lot of folks don't know about that. You right click anywhere, click on customize columns. And what I'm going to do just to kind of simplify this thing, I'm going to get rid of all the possible columns I can. So I'm just going to click remove and just leave name. I'm going to go down here to my custom fields which is my product type, which should be here somewhere under P. So there's my product type. And I usually make them all uppercase, and that's actually a very important trick. I make them all uppercase to make sure that I know that it's a custom field, because QuickBooks doesn't make everything all, all uppercase. Only users can make things uppercase. So that's how I know it's a custom field. So unfortunately, it doesn't tell you it is one, so that's the only way to do it. And then we got color, and then we go to add, and then we hit OK. So basically, what I've essentially done is I, I've I've only shown my item names, the product type, and the color. Now, I, I can also customize and add what I want. I mean, if I really want to see the asset account, and I want to see the cost of goods sold account, and the cost. And again, you get to choose what you want to see. And, and, and for some cases, I do a lot of inventory consulting. In some cases, less is more. So the more information you show uh, someone, sometimes the more confused you make them. So it's really up to you on on how you want to organize this list. But what's really cool about this is you can choose the order of the columns and you can also sort. So when you click here, it says product type, I can click on that and it will sort them, it will sort them for me. So we'll put uh, both uh, fixtures together. If I click on, on color, it will put both of them together. Um, and that obviously, because I have the sub items, I would have to switch this from hierarchical view to flat view if I didn't want to group them that way. And then we can actually see that these are now grouped together. Now what's what's valuable about this is also the filtering. So when I go here on the in uh, dropdown and I click on custom fields, I can type here golden and then click search and there it is. So it actually makes it extremely easy for us to group our products, find them, and organize them, especially when you're working with QuickBooks files that have really large item lists. The other reason why I like that is because when I'm creating a, an invoice and I'm here under item code, what I can do is I can click here where it says find and select items. 
And by the way, that's only available in enterprise. It's a little drop down thing that says I select items and I can do it from within the product here and I can click custom fields and I can type uh, golden and click on search and it will narrow them down. So make it so much easier to find the items uh, when they're grouped like that. So, but this little box here that you see uh, that you can open from the invoice is only available in enterprise. However, I'm gonna show you a, what I call a Jedi trick and I'm a big fan of Star Wars. So I'm gonna call this a Jedi trick. Not a lot of people know this. Um, so when you touch something like this, you want when I'm telling you it's a Jedi trick, I'm telling you pay attention. So let's say you don't have QuickBooks Enterprise and you have QuickBooks Pro or QuickBooks Premier and you wanna be able to search an item. Let's say for example, I'm looking for uh, this item here which I know that the word polished is part of the description. Now, if, you're, if I were to just type the word polished in there, P-O-L, it doesn't show up. It, you can't see it. It doesn't filter it. Why? Because QuickBooks doesn't search within descriptions. So if I'm working with QuickBooks Pro Premier or Accountant, which is basically Premier, what I can do is I can click on uh, any empty field on the item code, hit control L on the keyboard and control L is the shortcut for opening up my item list. Then I can search for the item. So I'm looking for uh, the word polish and I'm gonna click search. So let's say I did polish. Okay, so now I'm figuring out which item I wanna sell and let's say it happens to be this one. Now this is the trick, pay attention. I'm gonna select the item, I'm gonna hit control U. And then what it does is it will insert the item from my item list into the invoice. One more time, because again, that's a Jedi trick. So I'm gonna click on the empty slot, hit control L, uh, search, let's say for example, golden or whatever it happens to be, pick the item that I want. And as long as I had selected an empty field on the invoice, hit control U and it brings it uh, right over. So that's actually a really important uh, trick for non-enterprise users that cannot do the item search within, um, within it. Okay, there we go. So let me go ahead and clear that out and let's go to the next thing. Okay, so let's talk about inventory center. So we're gonna switch over to the inventory center. So we're gonna click on the inventory menu at the top of the screen and we're gonna click inventory center. And the inventory center is only available on Premier or Enterprise. Um, so QuickBooks Pro doesn't have this. And essentially what the inventory center is, which is really awesome, it's a center just like the customer center, just like the vendor center, but it's all about uh, items, most specifically inventory items. Uh, you're unfortunately not gonna see non-inventory and you're not gonna see service items. You're only gonna see inventory and assembly. But what's really cool about this is I can come down here, select any of the items that I want and just click on them. And then I'm gonna have a, a quick, change screen where I can sit here and I can change the prices and the cost and all that stuff on the fly right from here. And if you're working with enterprise, you can change the margin and the markup. That's only an enterprise feature. Uh, QuickBooks Pro Premier is only custom price, but in enterprise, you can actually use a margin or a markup feature for that. You get a quick preview, like reorder point, quantity on hand. In other words, I don't have to go inside the item to view these things. I can do them right on the fly on this screen. And then the other really cool thing that it has is, it has this little section here where I can click and drag an image um, for, um, let's see if I have any pictures here somewhere. Of course, I don't have a picture to add in there. <laughs> you would think you always have a picture somewhere in your computer, but I don't want here. But um, basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna click and drag uh, any, any picture you have. Oh, there you go, I got one there. Uh, so I click and drag any picture in there and now you can make uh, that picture your inventory picture. So that's only really useful for people that are dealing with a lot of tiny little widgets and they really don't know what the, the P5047-33 means. By looking at the picture, maybe they recognize it or understand what the product is. Now there's one little drawback there. Uh, the picture itself doesn't show on an invoice or on an estimate. It's only for the purposes of this screen. That picture will only be useful on this screen and you kind of have to you know, scroll this down a little bit to be able to have access to it. And the other really cool thing about the inventory center is you can actually pick any item and then look at the entire history of the item and group it by transaction. So I wanna see every single time I uh, sold this item. So I'm gonna click on all sales transactions and it's gonna show me every single transaction that has that item associated with it. Extremely powerful screen 
extremely useful stuff. I can see any ones that are on sales orders, whether it's all sales orders or open sales orders, it's actually great. I can see if they were used on estimates. I can see if they were used on uh, sales receipts, uh, credit memos, etc. Okay, so that's uh, the real powerful uh, part of dealing with the inventory center. Okay, let's talk about uh, units of measure now. Now, I could spend an entire hour talking about units of measure. Uh, this is an extremely important aspect of manufacturing, of dealing with uh, manufacturing assembly. You will almost find that every single manufacturing business will use uh, multiple units of measure. It's more common in manufacturing than everything else, but you don't have to be in manufacturing for this to be important. Now, multiple units of measure are only available in Premier or Enterprise. Uh, QuickBooks Pro only does single units of measure. So let me show you how that works. Okay, so let me go into my item list from here. And let's say, for example, let me hit reset. So let's say, for example, that I have a particular item that I can either sell by the unit, by the box, or by the crate. And let's go back to our test inventory item here. I'm going to right-click and edit it. And let's say those are my three measurements. I have the unit, the box, and the, tr and the crate. And the box has 12, and the crate, let's say, has 107. Okay, uh, actually, that, that wouldn't make any sense. So let's say it has a 120. Okay, so I'm going to create a new unit of measure set. Um, and you don't have to create a new one per item, but in this case, I'm going to create a new one just to kind of show you the process. And then all the items that use the same concept of by the unit, by the Dawson, and by the crate, uh, you will use them around the same uh, unit of measure set. So I'm going to create a new unit of measure set, and we're going to choose the type. So you can either go for other and just do everything manually, or you can go with count or length or weight if that's what you're using. So in this case, we're talking about units, so it's going to be count. So I'm going to hit next. So it tells me what is your default unit of measure? What's your most simple uh, uh, counted unit of measure? The, the, the lowest, this is really the lowest unit of measure that you use for inventory stocking and inventory control purposes. Like now it's possible that I may sell to someone half a unit or three quarters of a unit or whatever, but when I go count them and where I order them, my default unit measure, it's the question that is asking me here. So in this case, it's going to be each. So I'll click on finish. Perfect. And I'm going to go back and uh, actually I hit cancel by mistake. So let's click uh, each and then click uh, finish. I already did that. And then I'm going to go ahead and, oh, okay. So I just noticed that um, my multiple units of measure isn't turned on. So right now we're using single units of measure. So let me go, go back for a second and go to edit and go to preferences and turn that on. So that, that's actually really important to mention up front. And we're going to uh, go into preferences, inventory, items and inventory, company preferences, and we're gonna switch from single unit of measure to multiple unit of measure. So we only had single selected, so you can only pick one, but now when I pick multiple, you're gonna see uh, it's gonna change. The whole dynamics gonna change a little bit. So let me go ahead and change that and follow through. Let me go back into my item now. So we should be able to now see a different screen. So I'm gonna double click there and let me create my unit of measure set now and do the same thing, follow the same process, count. Next, we're gonna pick each. Again, this is my base unit of measure, my lowest one that I will use to purchase, sell, or count. I'm gonna click on next. And then I'm gonna, it gives you some predetermined ones, which I can, I can skip, uh, which I, I am gonna do it for the purposes, and I'm gonna create my own. So I'm gonna call this one a 12 unit, I'm gonna call this a 12 unit box. And the abbreviation would be box 12 count, right? And I could type whatever I want here. You can type whatever you want here. You can also do it by the dozen, but let's say we, we want to call it box 12 CT. And then the, the number of each that go in a 12 CT would be 12. And the second one would be uh, one crate. I'll put in parentheses 120 items. We can call it. Uh, 10 boxes, whatever you want to call it. This is just free type. Right? It doesn't matter what you type here. And then we're going to call this uh, 12 box crate. Okay. And we're going to call this 120. Perfect. And then we'll hit uh, next. 
And I can't do parentheses, so I'm going to do take that out. Forgot about that. And then I'm going to hit next. And then it's telling you what is the default unit of measure when you put this in a purchase order. So I'm going to say that when I buy these, I always buy them by the crate. Let's say my vendor only sells them by the crate, which is the reason why I'm creating this. And when I sell them, let's say I'm only selling them by, uh, or my default one is by the box, but I could essentially um, sell them by the unit. Or maybe when I ship them, you know, I ship them by the box, but sell them by the unit. So you have a lot of flexibility here. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on next. And the unit of measure set, we're gonna call it uh, each box hyphen crate. Okay, give it whatever name you want. Click finish, and then there is. There's my unit of measure set that now I can use with multiple items. So I'm not stuck with uh, that. Okay, and again, the name itself that I used, don't don't get too much into the weeds of that. Okay, so let me go ahead and hit okay. Let me explain to you the, the significance of that. So let's say this this cost is per each, right? So my cost is per each. So I'm going to put seventy-five dollars each. And let's say I don't know my cost per unit. Let's say I know my cost per box. Well, let's say my cost per box, let's say is $800. So then I would just do a quick calculation, 800 divided by 12, and then my cost is 66.66. So I do have to make sure that when I, I'm talking about cost and sales price is by the unit because that's what I told it was my base unit of measure. And this is where a lot of folks uh, get uh, confused. And let me just go back for a second because I wanna make sure this is right. So I got, my uh, 10 box crate because I had called it 12 box crate. So making sure there's no confusion there. So it was a 12 box crate and then hit okay and then hit uh, okay. So what is the significance of this? The significance is, let's say for example, I went to create a purchase order. I pick any vendor, it doesn't really matter. And then I pick my, my inventory part that I'm working with. So I'll put test and by default quantity one unit of measure one crate. So it takes and multiplies my $800 per box or my 66.667 per box uh, per unit into the $8,000, right? So that's a really important piece that by default, it will use whatever we told it we wanted the default to be. Now, let's say for example, this happens to be a special case when I'm not buying a 12 box crate, maybe I'm just buy, buying 90 units. So if I'm buying 90 units, what I wanna do is I wanna go back into quantity, type 90, and then choose here what exactly I'm buying. So I'm buying 90 units, so I'm gonna click on 90, 90 each, right? So I have to make sure that I follow the drop down, and QuickBooks will convert that into my 66 cost and multiply that times uh, 90. So that's a really that's an area where a lot of people get confused because they don't follow that process in that sequence, everything uh, becomes a mess. So uh, that is probably as much as a, a unit of measure I want to cover. And again, I could, could go really deep in this because there's a lot of all tons of moving parts, especially when we go by, you know, let's say kilos and pounds and when it gets really, really hairy. So one thing I'll tell you, will be just kind of a quick tip here. I'm gonna go into uh, Google and show you something that's really, really cool. Uh, whenever I'm dealing with manufacturing clients that start telling me things in pounds and in grains and in pints and in kilos, I just do my conversion here in Google. So I put one LB to kg. I literally just type that, one LB to kg, and Google will give me a the conversion. So if I need to know what the conversion is, just ask Google, just type, your unit measure type two and then your next unit measure and it will tell you what the conversion is. So if somebody tells me, yeah, I buy these in 17 pound bags, but I count them by the kilogram, then I would have to come in here and type 17. And, and then when I, in QuickBooks, I have to make sure that on the conversion, I put 7.71107 as the conversion from a 17 pound bag to uh, kilograms. And I guess, like I said, I could spend an entire hour <laughs> talking about uh, units of measure. Now, one of the common questions that we get is, you know, can we have a different sales price based on the unit of measure? And the answer is no. There's a, QuickBooks only manages a single unit of, a single price based on the base unit of measure. And if there's a different price, you're gonna have to manually change it when you're selling or if in the case that you're uh, buying. Okay, there, there's an exception to the rule. There's something called advanced pricing, which is available in QuickBooks Enterprise 
uh, Platinum only that allows you to set a sales price for volume discount, but volume discount has nothing to do with unit of measure, has to do with volume. So, so the answer to the question, you know, could, could you have a different price per uh, unit of measure? The answer is no, but could you set a volume discount based on the number of units you're buying? The answer is yes. Uh, for sales. So you would have to have the advanced uh, pricing feature turned on. And again, I could probably spend a whole hour talking about that one. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, that was the premise. So let's talk about uh, how that works in manufacturing. And units of measure, like I said, are particularly important when it comes to uh, manufacturing. So when you manufacture and when you assemble, uh, in essence, what you do is you take multiple inventory parts, which will now be known as my raw materials, and you make them into a new assembled part, which will now be your your inventory that's ready to sell or your finished goods. So let's convert this example to a manufacturing situation. So let me go into the list menu and go into the item list. And what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that all of these items are set up as, instead of asset account durable goods, we're gonna call all these stuff, we're gonna call it raw materials. I'm gonna type here raw materials. So I'm gonna create a new inventory uh, asset account called raw materials. And I'm now calling all my inventory parts raw materials. I actually don't have, when you have manufacturing, you don't have inventory parts anymore. You either have raw materials or you have finished goods. And then there's some work in progress in the middle which we just cannot get into is way too much. <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll think of that dimension, raw materials and uh, and finished goods. So I changed it just for one uh, item. But what I'll do is I'm going to show you a really awesome technique, which is you go to the item list. And we're going to go to this menu and then click on add, edit, multiple list entries. And we're going to hit uh, list. We're going to hit inventory parts. And then we're going to go to view and we're going to click all items. And let's say that all I'm trying to do is I'm going to replace the asset account of all my current inventory parts to raw materials. So I'll just type here raw materials on one of them, right click and click on copy down and then click save changes. And you're going to notice that in one fell swoop, uh, all your current inventory parts will be, uh, re- the asset account will be replaced. Now, uh, when you do that, there is one challenge, which I'll discuss right after the polling question. So let me do one, one more polling question real quick, because we're getting close to the the hour here. I wanna make sure we don't miss for the folks that, that do their CPE. So I'm also gonna show you one more thing, which is um, you know noticing what happens when you change that inventory part, but maybe it doesn't apply into the financial statement. So we'll, we'll discuss that. Uh, for now, let's see what we got. Um, two, 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 two. Somebody says, can you have raw materials that you can sell as well? So I, I would say, yes, uh, yes, you can have raw materials that you sell as well. That, just because I called the raw materials, I am not prohibiting QuickBooks from stocking them or giving you the capacity to sell them. So, so it's not an issue. It, it's still in QuickBooks terms, it's still an inventory part. It's just for for balance sheet presentation purposes, it's all gonna be called raw materials because I'm gonna create my uh, new inventory assemblies. I'm gonna create them as uh, finished goods. Let's see. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. What about manufacturing companies? We're about to cover that. Uh, let me see. I wonder why they gave you the search only in enterprise. Well, that's enterprise is the better edition. So <laughs> that's why they only give you extra features on the enterprise. Somebody says, so you don't use subclasses for different products and, uh, or use the same type and add a custom field. So James is asking why I made the comment of not using items and sub items or subclasses, whatever they meant to say. And I use custom fields in- instead. The answer is yes. I like custom field better than sub items. Okay, so let me stop the polling question. Thank you for answering that. And let's go into our balance sheet real quick. And uh, let's take a look at, so you see how all the 
uh, inventory parts was changed to raw materials now. So I was going to show you that if it doesn't change, you have to go back, change it again, and, and go back and change it until you see all the historically changed. So now all my current inventory parts are now known as raw materials. So what we're going to do is we're going to create now an assembly. So let's go to a list, item list, and maximize this. And we're going to create a new inventory assembly for manufacturing. So we're going to go to item. We're going to click new. Okay. And then we're going to create an inventory assembly. And we're going to call this one a, let's call it a golden kit. Okay. We're going to call this a golden kit. And then down here in the bottom, we're going to choose the components that are inside of the golden kit, which in this case would be what they call the bill of materials. Now, if you're dealing with more than four, because there's only four lines here, you want to click on here where it says uh, full view, and it'll give you a much bigger list to be able to deal with your um, bill of materials. So in here, I'm just going to come in and, and select uh, all the products that I want to have here. So let's say this golden kit is going to have uh, two of these fixtures, and it's going to have uh, one of this uh, glass and it's going to have let's say one of these uh, chandeliers and it's going to have let's say uh, a white dome and let's pick another one let's pick uh, 20 specialty valves so let's say it uses a whole bunch of valves so this is basically when you create a kit um, that's assembled that means that you're going to extract it from your inventory uh, raw materials value and you're going to transfer it to my new finished good uh, asset value. I'm gonna do it via the bill of materials. And right here it tells me that the projected cost for all this is $220. So we're gonna hit okay. And then based on this $220, and that, then maybe I can set a price. So let's say for example, the sales price of this is gonna be, let's say 400. And then up here where it says cost, this is just what your reference cost is. So in this case, I like to use uh, total BOM cost, so it just copies the 220 from down here. That way, if the cost varies from my components, my reference cost for the entire assembled unit uh, changes as well. So there we go. So we got sales price of 400. We have our cost of 220. Uh, the income account when I sell this is gonna go into revenue. And then here under my asset account, here's when I'm gonna create a new asset account called finished goods perfect so this is all going to go into my finished goods inventory asset account and then click save and close and then click on ok okay now when i go into my balance sheet none of that stuff is changed because we are not uh we haven't assembled it yet we just created the inventory uh assembly item we now have to create the kit we have to assemble it we have to manufacture it so we have to process what's called the build so what we're going to do is we're going to go into the vendor menu and uh, depending on the version that you have it may be on the inventory menu so sometimes it's on the vendor inventory build and sometimes it's on the inventory build so i'm going to click on build assemblies then i'm going to click on the drop down menu here and I'm going to pick a uh, golden kit right that's the only inventory assembly item I have and then I'm going to tell it that on the 21st let's move it one more day let's make it the 22nd so we can see the effect of that I want to build let's say 12 of these now down here in the bottom really really important this tells you based on the calculation that you can only build 10 and that's because uh, one of your uh, units has only 10 and it requires one per build so you're not going to be able to build 12 so that's actually a really good important piece to distinguish from here so let's build all 10 and again if you were physically able to build 12 you have to go back and adjust your inventory parts to make sure that they're accurate, right? Uh, that way it allows you to actually build. So I'm gonna click on build and close. And I'm gonna show you the balance sheet now dated on the 22nd. And I'll click on customize report, previous period, dollar change and hit okay. And we're actually going to see what, what happened, right? We'll see that when we build it, 
we removed $2,500 from raw materials and we moved it into finished goods. That's the purpose of, um, of uh, managing assemblies is we want to track our inventory in raw material format until we fully assemble it to then track it into finished goods. And then finally, when I go invoice it, let me go ahead and create an invoice here at random and I'll pick my new uh, golden kit and let's say I'm going to sell two of them and click save and close. I will now see that my finished goods went down by that amount. I'm going to double click on that 1680 so we can see the $2,100 when we assembled it and then the $420 cost of goods sold when we sold it. And I'll hit escape and I'll hit escape. All right. So that's manufacturing. Now there's one really tiny, uh, cool topic that is really worth mentioning, which is QuickBooks Enterprise that allows you to do what's called component replacement. Whereas let's say, for example, you have a whole bunch of inventory assemblies and they're all using one component that you can't buy anymore or it's been discontinued. So before they added this feature, you had to go back into each bill of materials and replace the unit. So I'll show you that in product so you can see what, what I mean by that. So I'm going to go into my item list here and I'm going to open up my, my golden kit for a second just to show you. And let's say that this uh, fixture here, the white dome, was replaced. So what I want to do is I want to tell QuickBooks that any assembly that's using this particular item to replace it with something else. So instead of changing it manually here, which I can do, uh, we're going to work under the assumption that there is uh, a whole bunch of um, of there's a whole bunch of uh, inventory assemblies already, and then I want to basically change them all on the fly. So I'm going to go here into the item menu, or actually, they hide these things some somewhere, and I'm going to right here. I'm going to right click and I'm going to click on where used in assemblies. That's where it is. They hide these things sometimes. And then I'm going to pick uh, the item. I'm going to say, look, anytime I'm using this particular item, I want you to replace it with a new item. Let's say I want to replace it with, instead of a white dome, a golden amber chandelier, whatever. And then it's going to give you a list here of every single assembly that's using that component that's about to be replaced in batch. So I basically select all the ones I want to replace, click replace. And then when I go back into my golden kit, I should now see my new item uh, that replaces. So I no, no longer have that white dome. Now I replaced it with another golden amber. So that's a really cool feature worth talking about because it's one of the reasons why I tend to recommend uh, QuickBooks Enterprise for my uh, inventory clients more than anything else. Okay, let me launch one more polling question and we have we have two more and we got five minutes. So we got plenty of time. And I know here in the CP Academy world, I'm not really allowed to go over. So <laughs> I would go over if I was allowed to, but, um, but we'll see how much we can cover in the next uh, five minutes. So while the polling question is up, let's see what we got in terms of questions. One of the common questions I get is, how do we include uh, labor costs in the value of our inventory um, uh, assembly items? So I'm gonna answer that verbally real quick, but I'm gonna refer you to uh, my YouTube channel. There is a video in which I explain adding labor costs into inventory parts. But in essence, you have to create a service item and give it a rate. So you're gonna give it, let's say, $20 an hour or whatever. And you're going to create one for each uh, labor unit that you want to use. And then you're going to add that uh, service item in, in inside of your bill of materials times the number of hours or whatever it is that you're going to do. And QuickBooks will actually extract from the expense account of labor and move it into inventory part. So that's a lot. <laughs> Uh, that, that's a lot. Okay. Um, but that could be done. Um, it's not pretty, but it could be done not 
design intuitively to make it easy for you to add labor to it. That's actually complex in itself. Okay, so um, so that was I'm gonna call that. Let's call this part one. This is part one of managing um, uh, QuickBooks inventory uh, through QuickBooks Desktop. So we'll stop there. I'm gonna I'm gonna go over the deck real quick because I want to make sure that we cover that. And then on part two, and we'll figure out when we're gonna schedule that one. Uh, on part two, we're going to talk about the rest of the stuff, which is uh, non-posting transactions. So um, estimates, purchase orders, and pending invoices do not affect your inventory, do not increase or decrease your inventory. So keep that in mind. Um, also keep in mind that if you're working with Premier and Enterprise, uh, you can work with sales orders, which are the best way to track your back orders from your customers. If your customer wants to buy something from you, and you don't have it in stock, best thing you can do is create a sales order and um, and tell QuickBooks that your that, that your next time you bring them in, they're committed to a customer, and you're gonna follow a sales order fulfillment workflow. Uh, then it's really important to keep in mind which transactions affect your inventory. So uh, invoices, sales receipts, vendor credits, credit card credits, and statement charges will decrease your inventory, and item receipts and bills, check, credit card charge, and credit memo will increase your inventory. And inventory adjustments are extremely important, so I'm going to cover that really quick because that's the heart of the inventory system. And uh, finally, your inventory reports, which I'll cover the most important inventory report. And the next, the rest of the slides, which I recommend you read, kind of explain you know, why QuickBooks Pro over QuickBooks Online for inventory, why QuickBooks Premier over Pro for inventory, why Enterprise over Premier for inventory, and why Enterprise Platinum over the other enterprises for inventory. So that's all covered there. And my favorite slide in the world, which is what can QuickBooks not do? If you actually are in the in the QuickBooks consulting business, you want to print this out and put it in a, in a poster really, really big in your office because you need to identify really, really quick what is the stuff that people are trying to achieve that just just not going to get there in QuickBooks unless you you do some really strange workarounds? So having this is really really important and handy. And by the way, this is 15 years of QuickBooks experience all in one slide. So I recommend that you have this and you ask questions around this. And if you are going to bring in a new inventory engagement, you want to bring these questions right away and tell the client, hey, are any of these things uh, something that um, that you're going to want because you want to bring that up uh, before that. So before we wrap things up, let me just show you one last thing. And I'll let the CPA Academy people stop me when I must be stopped. So I'm going to go into the inventory menu and click on adjust quantity and inventory value on hand. And if I want to modify one of the quantity on hands for one of these units, so let's say I'm selecting a couple of units here and I'm physically going into my warehouse and I'm physically doing a cycle count for every one of these units and it turns out that I actually had two of these and I actually had uh, five of these and I actually had 34 of these, what ends up happening is in this screen, you tell QuickBooks what the new corrected quantity is and QuickBooks will keep track of how much uh, adjustments it needs to make into the books, into your cost of goods sold and your inventory asset account, which in this case is $109. And we're gonna send that into the purchases cost of goods sold account. And we're gonna make this the 22nd as well. Let's make this one the 23rd, just so we can look at the report. And then we'll click on save and close. And again, traditionally, I always like to look at the profit and loss and balance sheet so I understand exactly what is happening every single time I create a transaction in QuickBooks. So we're gonna make that the 23rd and compare it with the last day. And we'll make this one the 23rd with the 23rd so we can see what the effects of an inventory adjustment does. So as you can tell, when I adjusted my inventory, it now created a cost of $109 because the inventory disappeared, right? The net change of inventory. And then my raw materials went down by 100 and nine. So that's uh, the last thing I wanted to show you to make sure that you know you have that in in the presentation, and I have some you know some ideas about where you can research of inventory add-ons that do beyond what QuickBooks cannot do. So that's what that slide is, and definitely download the slide and check out all those links. 
all of those resources are extremely useful. These are years and years of inventory consulting all put into, I have matrices, comparison matrices, uh, feature head-to-head online versus desktop. I have a, a inventory questionnaire, which I, I think is one of the most valuable things that you can download if you're just getting in the QuickBooks inventory um, world. I'm going to show you what that looks like real quick. So it's basically a set of questions that I ask uh, new clients that want my help when it comes to inventory. And I ask them all these questions. And this would give me tons of insight about what is their expectation of what they want QuickBooks to do or they want me to do as a accountant, as a consultant when it comes to the inventory. So check out those resources, check out the videos, and I answer as many questions as possible. I'll stay on as much as I can. There's my email. If you got inventory questions, I'm typically pretty good at either giving you the answer or sending you to a video that I've already created with the answer. And of course, you know, if you, if you need to hire me for an inventory project, I'm available. But most importantly, I like to thank Avalara for giving me the opportunity to share what I know. Uh, leader in sales tax compliance, thank you very much for sponsoring this webinar. And I think that we're out of time.